EUTF, AML, uh, THB project. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, it's not. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Just a small correction. Um, um, there is a new president for, I think, Iaka. Uh, um, so I think there is only, um, uh, she is with the Arin at the moment, Lillian. That's the correction she's made. And uh, finally, if we can have Jennifer um, Riddle, um, uh, Justice Advisor, Criminal Justice Advisor, Nairobi. Um, from the UK and specialist prosecutor. Thank you. Our uh, conversations this afternoon would go around harmonization of asset recovery legal framework and uh, money laundering and asset uh, uh, recovery um, discussion. Um, Probably what we should be sharing are our experiences, country experiences, and uh, what we can do in terms of uh, legal framework so that it can be harmonized. I will listen to a presentation by the um, AMI, the director of Nagitri, uh, Center for Ethics and Public Integrity. Um, after that, we'll go straight into uh, the other uh, panelists and then um, uh, plenary. Thank you very much. Ami, you have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, I'm going to do that again. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am so thrilled and honored to be here. Um, I will be the lead off speaker here. I'll start by talking um, when the PowerPoint slides are launched. Um, about a criminal case that I did as a federal prosecutor in New York City that had some transnational aspects. It included drug dealing, it included money laundering, and it included a bunch of murders. And um, there are tools that we used in this case that I think are useful for even other types of complex cases, like the wildlife smuggling cases that have been discussed by my colleagues here earlier in this meeting, and some of the other complex cases. So um, while I'll be talking about an American case and tools that we used in, in that system, I hope that some of the lessons are useful and uh, provide a, an awesome starting off point um, for the rest of the panelists to discuss uh, many of the other uh, information that they have about uh, how things are done in their countries. So if we could get the PowerPoint slides launched, great. Um, we can move on to the next slide, please. So I'll first start with just an overview of this case. It um, was sort of a multi-step thing. We started with an investigation that was, that was secret, that was covert, and then we had initial charges. And then we had uh, what we sometimes call a takedown in the United States, that is uh, an arrest of a number of defendants. We then engaged in more investigation. We filed additional charges. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the issues that prosecutors faced in that case. I'll also talk about some of the international outreach because this was a transnational criminal organization and included money laundering in, in another country. If I have time, I'll briefly touch on a couple of the trials from the case, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the resources that the National Association of Attorneys General, where I work, uh, offers for prosecutors. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Great, thank you. So we used a number of different uh, types of investigative tools during the investigation. We uh, talked with confidential informants that are people who were involved in crimes themselves. We engaged in seizures of drugs, of uh, narcotics proceeds, of drug money. Uh, we, used, we issued subpoenas, a court process that required banks and phone companies and other entities like that to give us information that we needed to investigate our case. We also executed search warrants where we went to judges and got authority to search uh, vehicles, to search uh, residences, to search other uh, types of places. Um, we also had wiretaps in, in both um, the, the state system and the federal system. Uh, there are two different systems in the US. I don't want to belabor that point, but we uh, were able to work with, with both of them for this case. And then the law enforcement officers also engaged in surveillance. Um, next slide, please. So I'll talk just a little bit about a couple of the seizures and the types of subpoenas, like I said, that, that we issued. Um, this, was, this was a drug case, it was a marijuana case, and these uh, defendants primarily uh, 
got their marijuana in Florida, a U.S. state in the south of the U.S., and then brought it up via tractor trailers to New York, where they then sold it. Um, so then money oftentimes had to go back down south, back from New York to Florida um, or to the Dominican Republic, where some of the, uh, some of the uh, people who were involved in this conspiracy, in this operation, uh, lived. Um, and so there were interdictions, there were stops of uh, couriers, of people who were moving money in the airports. Um, and, and one uh, seizure that I'll mention, it was a, a seizure of $300,000 from four individuals who were going back to the Dominican Republic with uh, narcotics proceeds. And as I said, we also issued subpoenas uh, for things like bank records and for phone records. Next slide, please. And this is just an example, this is not the largest seizure, but this is an example of one of the executions of a search warrant. Um, it was on one of the, the drug locations. They seized, I think, around $75,000, around 22 pounds of marijuana. These were two people who were associated with that space. And I'll uh, ask for the next slide. And I'll segue to uh, one of the other really important pieces of uh, investigation that we were able to do for this case and that was wiretaps. Um, how many of you uh, have authority to request wiretaps in your uh, countries? To request, to request. How many, how many people can go to a court to ask for authority to uh, listen in on people's telephone calls? Uh, just do your statutes, do your laws allow for this, whether you've ever done it or at all? Okay, I'm seeing some. Okay, and how many of you have actually gone through that process to request authority to listen in on telephone calls with judicial uh, oversight? Okay, Han is saying a lot. All right, we, we have here, okay, terrific. So some of you, and, and for those of you who don't have that authority, I apologize that I'll be talking about it. It's not all that useful to hear about other people's tools, but for those of you who do, who do and who have used it, uh, you understand uh, both how, um, powerful of a tool it can be, and also how careful you need to be as a prosecutor to uh, seek the appropriate authority to be able to, to use that powerful tool. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So we engaged in wiretaps. Uh, we had court authorized uh, a opportunity to listen in on uh, a number of different telephones that were controlled by a number of different uh, people who were part of this organization. Um, in the U.S., the federal requirements are, are pretty strict to be able to, to get authority to listen in like this. Um, we have to show probable cause that the evidence, uh, that the interception that is listening in will reveal evidence that an individual is committed or uh, is committing or is about to commit a serious crime. And there are only certain crimes that we're allowed to get wiretaps to, to request. We also have to show that we've tried other things and those things haven't worked. We've exhausted our other investigative techniques. Uh, there's a really stringent approval process within the office of the prosecutor, within uh, the people at the main Department of Justice, and then with, uh, before a federal judge. So there's a lot of oversight. And then you're required to monitor these calls at all times. And you can only listen in on the ones that are, that are pertinent, that are, that are actually uh, about a crime. And you can't listen to things that, uh, that, that you don't have sort of authority to listen to. So there's a lot of oversight, but this can be an extremely powerful tool for, uh, for a prosecutor to use in the right type of complex case, including, again, uh, the types of cases that my colleagues have been discussing uh, during this week. Could we go to the next slide, please? So the wiretaps uh, let us uh, hear the defendants talking about things like the seizures that we obtained, like the searches that we executed. Um, you could actually hear the defendants talking about these things, so that was one other way to sort of link them, um, if they went to trial, to that location. We also were able to sort of expand out to, to new targets. So I have as an example here uh, one of the defendants um, telling, uh, he, they happen to be brothers, Ariel and Kenny were brothers, uh, one of the defendants telling uh, his brother, you gotta pay Shorty his money. And there was something about the way that that call went that caused the agents to think, this person may be sort of an important person for us to look a little bit more closely at. And so you hear a call that, that same day later on where Kenny tells Shorty, I have 25 and they arrange to meet. Next slide, please. And so the law enforcement officers who are working with us surveilled this meeting. They saw these two people meet 
And then about an hour later, they pulled over the person who had gotten something from Kinney. And um, they were able to determine that the person who, who was being called Shorty on the phone was somebody named Manuel Rodriguez. And that person said, um, I'm in real estate in Florida and New York, and sort of seemed very comfortable talking with the law enforcement officers. Uh, the law enforcement officers located $25,000 cash, that 25 that was referred to in the wiretap, uh, in that vehicle, and they seized it. And after that, Manuel Rodriguez, Shorty, said, oh, I'm a silent partner in a restaurant. That money's from the restaurant. And the cash itself was subject to something called administrative seizure that I believe my friend Xavier will, will discuss um, during the panel uh, itself. So if we can move on to the next slide. Now, as we looked more closely at uh, Manuel Rodriguez Shorty, uh, we learned and the agents learned um, that he had a number of different cell phones and that they were compartmentalized. They were used for different purposes. So I'm seeing a nod here, so you're, you're familiar with that, that uh, operation. Um, so there was one phone that's in the red that was primarily used to uh, communicate with people who we sub subsequently learned were oftentimes engaged in violence on, on Rodriguez's behalf. Um, the blue phone was more to communicate with people who were involved in the money laundering side of things. Um, the phone right below, the, the green phones were all phones that were sort of part of the drug operation. The gentleman right below was uh, Rodriguez's brother. The two to the side were two people who were oftentimes in Florida. And then uh, you, you'd already met Kinney from the earlier slides. There was another phone that Rodriguez used primarily to communicate with that sort of group. So without kind of doing this long investigation, we wouldn't have sort of seen how big this operation was. Can we move on to the next slide, please? So uh, we were able to charge um, actually about 50 people in an initial, uh, in, an initial uh, in the US, it's an indictment. And there were three different cells. There was the Rodriguez cell, which I'll talk about more, and then a couple of other groups that um, were kind of headed by different people, but they were all operating together. Um, and so some of them were the people in Florida who were more involved in the growing of the marijuana. Some of them were the people who were in the transportation network. And some of them were the people who were more involved in selling and in uh, subsequent, we, we learned, uh, acts of violence in the New York City area. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please? So I, I use the word takedown, and I've been told that that's maybe not, not a common word. Again, that's something that um, in the US will sometimes use for, for a, a, a large-scale arrest. Um, and so just the, the procedures of executing arrests on so many people require a lot of planning by the prosecutors, require a lot of planning by the agents as well. As well. Uh, we also were prepared to execute search warrants on a number of different locations at the same time that people were arrested. So we got those from the judges ahead of time, and we were able to uh, seize things like firearms, like drugs, like money. Um, we also seized documents that then became very important for the subsequent money laundering investigation. Can we move on to the next slide, please? And so, as I said, there was more investigation. Uh, with that, we focused much more on the money laundering and on uh, what we learned was uh, 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 quite a bit of violence. Next slide, please. And um, how many of you have the ability to allow a defendant to choose to cooperate as part of your case? Yes, I've seen some. So if a defendant in your cases decides that he or she wants to cooperate with the investigation, can you put that person uh, on the stand to testify? I'll, it'll probably be the same hands, but I just want to get a sense. All right, so it's not as common. Oh, we've got one more back there, okay. So um, that's something that um, is, is pretty common in the United States, and I think when handled carefully, is a pretty powerful tool. So um, we had a number of different defendants uh, in this case who decided that they wanted to provide information to us. Um, we also had the ability to uh, seek to um, immunize, that is to give somebody the ability to not face charges um, in exchange for, uh, for, for pro them providing information. We only use that for, for very low level, uh, for people who are not significantly involved in, in serious criminal activity. Um, we also looked at the, at the records that we got from those search warrants 
and uh, were able to search at the telephones as well and obtain some really important information from, from phones. Um, we also, for some of the defendants, tried to monitor their prison calls to make sure that they weren't trying to do something that could hurt our witnesses. Uh, can we move on to the next slide, please? So there were kind of two different pieces of um, the, the money investigation here. Um, there was one part where we were kind of looking at just how the money was moving. I said before that the drugs sort of came up from Florida and then the money had to go back down. And then we were also looking at how the money was being laundered, how it was being sort of cleaned so that the defendants would be able to uh, try to make it look like it came from a legitimate source. Um, if I use the word hawala, how many, how many of you are familiar with that word? Getting some, getting some. All right, so um, basically we, we ended up um, sort of using, what's that? Yes, awesome, thank you. Um, so we learned that um, our sort of group of, um, of drug dealers who were selling drugs in New York and needed to get money back down to Florida to the people who, who sold the drugs to them originally, um, were having conversations with people who were involved in uh, sort of getting illicit medication from the New York City area who needed to sort of exchange money. So our Florida, our, uh, our, our group who had the drugs in Florida and needed to send the money back down was able to uh, sort of have conversations with people who needed to have money sent up to New York um, to avoid having to send the, the cash via tractor trailers because they were learning that this cash was getting seized. So um, this was something that the wiretaps allowed us to see and we were able to charge that as an unlicensed money transmittal because um, it wasn't really, it didn't really fulfill the money laundering requirements in the United States. Um, but then there was actual money laundering and that included um, using real estate, using sham businesses to sort of funnel in this dirty money to make it look like it was legitimate. Um, can we move on to the next slide? Thank you. So uh, we were able to move on with the case and charge um, in a sort of second group uh, a number of different people. The, the first uh, set of people were involved in kind of many aspects of the organization, in the drug dealing, in the violence, um, in the money laundering. The uh, individuals in red were people who were much more involved in, in just the violence. And then the, the last two people were involved more in the money laundering in, in New York City through real estate and in Florida through real estate. Um, next slide, please. And so we continued to investigate a number of those uh, individuals on the last slide chose to cooperate and we learned about uh, still, more, still more violence. We'd already charged five murders and five attempted murders, but as some of those individuals who we arrested on those serious charges chose to provide information, we were able to develop additional evidence to, to charge more murders. Um, next slide, please. And so uh, in the end, we ended up charging uh, this individual with ordering a, a total of 20 murders. We, next slide, please. And so we were able to file what um, basically additional charges. I, I have the, word, the term superseding indictment. That's just, um, just sort of a, a, a way of saying additional charges. And that included, um, again, the drug conspiracy that we'd started with, 10 murders and 10 attempted murders, and uh, money laundering, bank fraud, and a number of other sort of statutes in the US that are designed to kind of get to that sort of conduct. Um, next slide, please. And so these were um, the murder victims um, that, uh, that, that were some of the murder victims um, in, in this case. And the, the motives for some of these murders were, were pretty chilling. Um, the, the first person um, who, and, and this case was investigated from 2010 um, on, so these were already fairly, fairly cold cases. Um, but the, the first person who, whose murder we charged was killed in 1997 and uh, the, the lead defendant described ordering the murder as a way of giving himself a birthday present. Um, he'd been angry at this person who had been a rival for, uh, for the block for selling drugs there and, um, and chose to hire somebody to kill him. Um, there were other people who were killed for really fairly small things, the, the, the theft of a small amount of drugs, of money. Um, there were some people who were rivals, who were other people who tried to sell um, marijuana in the same place. So 
we were able to talk with um, people from uh, other investigative agencies who'd been trying to investigate these cases. We were able to talk with victims. We were able to talk with, uh, again, cooperating witnesses. We were able to kind of put together the evidence that was necessary to charge um, some murders that had happened um, at the time uh, many years earlier. Can we move to the next slide, please? And one of the sort of most chilling incidents um, in, involved uh, this young man who, uh, who, who stole some marijuana, who stole some money, and who was um, lured to a park and strangled and buried. Um, we searched for his body several times. Unfortunately, uh, we were not able to find it, but we were able to establish by talking with his friends about approximately when he disappeared, by talking with the witnesses, some of whom were involved in this murder, we were able to actually charge this murder and seek, seek some justice, some belated justice. Um, but as, as part of this you know, large case that again started with looking at the drugs and then included looking at money laundering, included looking at this violence, we were able to really um, find, find for some justice for this young man. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. So um, as you can imagine, I know one of the speakers yesterday uh, talked some about witness safety issues. Um, those kinds of things can be, can be um, sort of a huge issue in cases like this. Um, how many of your offices have some way of helping to keep witnesses safe, of maybe helping to move people if necessary, helping to um, keep them safe in some way? Do, do any of your offices have sort of structures for that? I'm seeing some nods, nods count. Yes, yes, okay. So you know how, how important that can be, um, particularly in these cases that involve some amount of violence. So while we were um, in the investigation, while we were uh, trying to intercept the telephone calls, um, we would, actually there was at least one instance where uh, one of the law enforcement agents notified somebody that he might be unsafe. So we were kind of listening in for those sorts of problems. Um, after we arrested uh, the, the individuals, we also did things while people were in custody, were in jail pending their trial, to try to ensure that everybody stayed safe. We had the ability to, within our prisons, uh, keep people separated, right? So that can be a really important thing um, if, if you have a, a number of different people, particularly when people decide that they want to cooperate. And in the US system, if somebody decides that they want to cooperate, oftentimes they come in, they meet with the prosecutor multiple times. If the other people in the case see that this person is going to court and nobody else is going to court, that's the kind of thing that can raise some red flags. So having people separated allows you to sort of try to keep people as safe as possible. Um, we also have um, an aspect of the witness security program that we can use even while people are, are in jail. Um, we also did what we could to uh, protect people from the, from the people who were incarcerated. Um, again, I mentioned that we uh, tried to monitor the prison calls. We would monitor mail coming and going. Um, there are even these things called special administrative measures that allow you to kind of keep even closer look um, on a particularly dangerous prisoner. So we did what we could to try to keep people safe during the investigation, including witnesses, family members. Uh, we were able to move some witness family members when, uh, when, when they had some concerns about their safety. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanna talk just a little bit about plea agreements because I, I know the DPP talked about them. They seem like they're particularly uh, common or, or there's something that Kenya at least is moving, moving toward. Um, how, can, can I get a show of hands about whether your countries allow for plea agreements of any kind? Getting some hands, some nods. All right, um, thank you. Um, so plea agreements can be, uh, can be extremely helpful. You also need to be cognizant of, uh, you know, that you're holding people properly accountable. So, you know, you can kind of think about factors, including the things that I have on the screen in the regular uh, area, when you're thinking about, you know, what the appropriate plea might be. Um, for financial crimes, sometimes you know, you'll, you'll be looking at the, the amount of, of money involved, for example. Um, for cooperation agreements, for the agreements that you enter into if a defendant decides that he wants to cooperate, there are kind of additional requirements. Um, you have to make sure 
um, that the defendant admits everything that he's done, right? Um, you have to be comfortable that if you call this person to testify, that he'll be testifying honestly. One of the ways that you would do that is to listen to a, a lot of different people and think about, you know, do, do, do their stories mesh? Does it seem like they're all talking about the same sort of thing that happened? Um, there are also other sort of requirements with cooperation agreements that a defendant has to agree to before you agree to allow him to, um, to enter into one with the government. Um, and so then if a defendant does that and is, is successful, then at the time the defendant is sentenced, the prosecutor will, in the federal system, make a motion to the judge to allow the judge to sentence the defendant to, to a lesser amount of time. So it can be um, extremely beneficial for defendants as well for them to enter into a cooperation agreement and successfully cooperate. Um, next slide, please. So I mentioned that this case had international aspects. Um, we did uh, extradite uh, one of the defendants from the Dominican Republic. Um, we were able to work sort of seamlessly to uh, ensure that we were able to get the post-arrest statement, um, which helped facilitate his extradition and his prosecution. Uh, we also issued a red notice on uh, some other defendants who were not in the United States. So there are these you know, structures that exist, Interpol, um, the office, uh, the OIA, um, that are really, really important to make sure that you're able to obtain witnesses, obtain defendants, obtain evidence in these uh, transnational cases. Next slide, please. We also um, actually seized assets in another country, in the Dominican Republic. Um, that was based on a court order that was issued by, by the court uh, where, where this case was charged, the Southern District of New York. And we had to show that there was probable cause that the proceed was involved or was the proceeds of basically this criminal organization. And we were able to uh, restrain the, the property to sort of seize it uh, by transmission, again, of a mutual legal assistance treaty request. And at the end of the case, uh, we were able to forfeit those, uh, those, those lands and um, obtain a money judgment. Now, I'll talk pretty quickly about a few of the trials that came out of the case. Um, the trials are important because, as other people have said, all of this investigation should be about getting evidence that is admissible, evidence that you can use in court. And so I'll touch briefly on some of the types of evidence that we used in these different trials. So for one of the trials, which involved uh, one of the people who had been in Florida, who had been sort of obtaining drugs there and sending them up to New York, we had cooperating witnesses, we had law enforcement witnesses, there were wiretap telephone calls, there were seizures of drugs, there were seizures of money, and then um, we had to prove sort of the amount of drugs. And that is one of the places where having the cooperating witnesses talk about how, how much they were, were dealing with this man um, while by um, sort of listening into the wiretaps and being able to pull from those wiretaps um, how much was, uh, was being transacted in any given um, sort of uh, exchange. Um, that was, those were two important, important pieces of information. There are also references in the wiretaps to years earlier deals, to the fact that they had been dealing together for many, many years, and so we were able to point out to, in our case, the jury, um, you could also point out to a judge, that that allowed you to sort of expand the amount um, when kind of thinking about how large this operation was. Um, we also, if we could go back just for a sec, we also used um, sort of a proof of unexplained wealth. Now, in the US, we don't have unexplained wealth orders. Um, I will admit that I'm a little bit uh, envious of those of you who do. Um, but being able to prove that somebody had a lot of money that came from a source that was not legitimate um, can be important proof when you're trying to show the scope of, of a criminal operation. So we were able to do things like obtain tax uh, records, obtain bank, report, bank accounts, um, obtain sort of information about the expenses to show that the amount of money that this person was spending was not consistent with the amount that he was claiming on his taxes. So it's sort of an argument that he had a lot of money coming in from, an, from a, not a legitimate source because he wasn't claiming it on his taxes. Um, next slide, please. And we did uh, a trial against one of the people who was, uh, I have racketeering trial, sort of an organized crime statute that is in the US. Um, that in included uh, much of the same uh, evidence. Um, we also um, 
uh, entered into to some other types of agreements with witnesses as well. Uh, next slide, please. And um, actually, if we could skip a couple slides, I see that my, my time is low and I want to make sure that I cover, so if we could go two more slides forward. Great, thank you. So um, I mentioned a, a person named Manuel Rodriguez. He was really sort of the, the person who'd ordered uh, most, uh, if not all, of the murders that we charged. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Um, he ended up entering into a plea agreement um, and, it, and he was sentenced to life in prison. Uh, that plea agreement included a $25 million forfeiture order. Um, he's under sort of very strict supervision within the prisons as well. And the, the judge um, who imposed the sentence is, is on the screen. She said that she determined that a life sentence was appropriate because of the breadth and violence of his criminal conduct, which showed an immense willingness and capacity to exact vengeance and violence. She talked about the collateral damage that, were, that was caused by his crimes and described them as catastrophic and immeasurable. So um, this was sort of the, the right result um, in, in a case that involved somebody who had really um, damaged his community and damaged the lives of, of these victims' families uh, immeasurably. Next slide, please. So um, these are sort of the, the takeaway. We, we were able to solve uh, more murders than just the ones that we charged in the case. Some of the cooperating witnesses admitted to murders that were sort of outside of this organization. And so we were able to uh, hold them accountable for those as well. Um, and I, I want to, in, in my uh, last couple of minutes, just talk a little bit about some of the resources that we have at NAG. So if we can go to the, the next slide. And then the next slide, please. So um, at the National Association of Attorneys General, uh, we offer webinars, we offer other types of trainings. We'll actually be doing an anti-corruption academy in the fall of this year. Uh, we have uh, a number of different centers that focus on different areas. Uh, mine actually focuses on corruption and ethics, um, which is not what I just talked about, um, but is a, another area where some of those same kind of complex investigative tools can be really important. Uh, we also have a NAGTREE Center for International Par uh, Partnerships, and Gina is the head of that center, so if you have any questions, I know Gina would be happy to talk with people. Uh, one of the resources that we have is, uh, is this book right here. It's an anti-corruption manual. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, please. And it's really the, the first book for, for state corruption prosecutors in the US. Um, it is pretty hefty, and it covers sort of every stage of corruption cases, from the investigation to the charging to the trial. We talk about legal issues. We talk about issues of strategy and ethical issues as well. Um, so uh, I, I know my time is short, so I will uh, thank you very much for your attention, and we'll look forward to hearing the panelists uh, who, who continue uh, after me. Thank you. I have a, a hand of applause. Thank you very much, Ami. Um, she has addressed a number of issues, and uh, one of the issues probably that should be playing on our mind is uh, how we can cooperate and uh, how, what, how much we can learn from uh, um, uh, the U.S. and uh, how much of it. There are issues to do with wiretaps, whether that really uh, uh, works in our countries or it doesn't work. There's another issue about unexplained wealth. Probably we'll have to go move on to the other panelists and listen to them and their experiences, and then we'll have discussions and uh, uh, comments on the issues that come up. Thank you. And, um, um, the first one to take the floor would be uh, the Prosecutor General for uh, the Republic of Rwanda. PG, please. Thank you. It's your floor. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share with you the Rwandan experience on harmonization of asset recover recovery legal framework. Uh, in Rwanda, we do have different provisions related to recovering uh, assets and proceeds of crimes, like the law relating to criminal procedure, the law on fighting corruption and related offenses. We do have a specific law governing recovery of offen offense related assets, and uh, the law also, the, also the law on uh, governing mutual legal assistance in criminal matters. In relation to the criminal pr procedure, for instance, uh, this law gi gives uh, powers to investigators and uh, prosecutors to seize object or put caveat on immovable assets, to freeze bank accounts and businesses' shares or their interest. The, the purpose of the, the, these powers is first of all for investigation, but also 
to recover the assets in a, in case of in case of conviction. Uh, the law on fighting against corruption gives an obligation uh, to the courts to order the confiscation of the property or proceeds of crime, re, of, or proceeds of crime, and the law governing recovery of offence-related assets obliges a, a prosecutor in his or her submission to include the proposal as to the allocation of the seized assets. And uh, it has also a provision related to, uh, to cooperation where it is said that the government may enter, enter into an agreement with the government of a foreign country for reciprocal sharing of investigated assets and uh, proceeds of, of crime. Uh, and the, the request for the sharing of assets with the foreign country is done by the Minister of Justice to another mini to his counterpart in a foreign country, of course, through the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The law governing mutual legal assistance in criminal matters also states, uh, has some provisions related to cooperation, especially in, in, uh, in relation to the search, seizure, tracing, identifying, freezing, restraining, and seizing proceeds uh, of crimes. But we, in Rwanda, we also do have uh, an annual asset declaration system, which is controlled by the office of the ombudsman. And the main objective is to prevent public officials from committing f uh, corruption and related, related crime. Every year, government officials have to declare their asset. And uh, failure to do so, if you fail to declare an asset, it can lead to uh, administrative sanction, but also uh, in the law, the anti-corruption law, we, we, we do have a provision related to illicit enrichment. Why this provision? Uh, we ha we, we, it's because we had realized that uh, some, some criminals tend to register their properties or their assets to other persons. And that's how we, ca we, we, we come up with this provision, where a person who cannot justify the source of his or her asset compared with his or her lawful income commit an offense. And uh, upon conviction that uh, the sanction uh, may be uh, between seven uh, and ten years of imprisonment. Uh, despite this legal framework, we, 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 we do have some challenges that, uh, that ca can be uh, addressed. The, the first challenge is the confi confi confidentiality among criminals or people who may have information Related, related to the assets of some criminals who sometimes are afraid to report those cases or give information. To address this, we, ha we have enacted a law on whistleblowers protection, but this is not enough. Still, some people are still afraid to report or to give information. That's the reason why, in addition to this legal framework, there is a need of uh, some other effective me me measures. But also we need to do sensitization for mindset change. Because sometimes people, when they, they report and they uh, get to be known, sometimes they think that it can cause them uh, some problems. So we, we need to really enhance uh, s these measures of whistleblowers protection. Uh, another challenge related to tracing assets hidden in foreign countries. And this requires uh, to enhance regional and international cooperation. But also, like uh, this experience of the offense of illicit enrichment or failure to justify the source of your asset if it is enacted as a crime in other countries, this can also help. Uh, 
But also another there is another challenge of communication related to long procedures when we cooperate with our counterparts. In the last meeting in Arusha, I remember that uh, I, I mentioned that uh, cross-border cross criminals do not have long procedures. It's dialect. Mm -hmm. So we also, we shouldn't have those long procedures. Otherwise, we, we will fail. So we, we, we need to look at again in our laws and see what we can, we can do. But in practice, there are some things that we can do in relation to the communication. For instance, the experience of Rwanda with uh, some, some we Western countries like France, Belgium, UK, Netherlands, we, 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 we do have also those long procedures that we, when you submit a request, it has to go to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. But we, we, ha we have adopted a system of uh, advanced copies. And in this, in this context, with the advanced copies, if you send an advanced copy, why waiting the Minister of Foreign Affairs to send some document, your counterpart can start some activities related to, for instance, tracing and identifying those, those assets. So it's something that can be done. Uh, we have started to do it with uh, my counterpart in DRC, but also uh, my counterpart here in Kenya. For instance, the way I do communicate with my counterpart here in Kenya, the DPP Kenya, we, we do it on WhatsApp. So if I get an information, I call him and uh, he tells me, can you send me that document on WhatsApp? At least we, we, with them, there are some activities that they can start to do while waiting for those uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs procedures. So there are some mechanisms that we can adopt and that can be ho ha helpful. And also I found brilliant the yesterday ideas of having lies on magistrates in different countries. That can also be helpful in tracing, identifying, and doing some other activities in relation to recovering uh, assets and uh, proceeds or, or, or of crime. There is another important aspect uh, before I conclude that we, we, we should adopt. That is the, co the coordination and collaboration uh, with uh, intelligence services. It is very, very helpful. We have to recognize that sometimes they do have tools that we do not have, like interception of communication. When you collaborate with those intelligence services, it gets much easier. An example, there were some notorious criminals. And it, they, they had managed to create a group of those criminals in stealing money in the banks. And uh, that group, was composed of some notorious criminals, some Kenyans, Ugandans, and when they, they would move, and when they reached Rwanda, they had started to recruit from even some uh, staff members of some banks. I think you, you know that case in Kenya, it's an equity bank case. So those people were arrested in Rwanda, and their accomplices, but we managed to do that because of intelligence services, because of collaboration and coordination with the intelligence services. So we have to recognize that those intelligence services, they, they, uh, they do have an easy access to information than prosecutors. So we have to work with them. And when you work with them at the national level, they also have their partnership with their counterparts in different countries. So that can also help in the this fight uh, in recovering uh, assets and proceeds of crime. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, there are so many aspects uh, we can take home. Um, uh, the PG has talked about bureaucracy, uh, tracing of assets. Um, advanced copy is a new thing that uh, maybe some of us can learn from and uh, informal networks his collaboration with uh, uh, colleagues such as uh, um, the DVP for, for Kenya. Um, now we move on to uh, Lillian uh, Kafiti, uh, President uh, for Arin East Africa. Um, 
Uh, it's your floor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Is, uh, is this afternoon? Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, the issue of mutual legal assistance and international cooperation. When I was leading the program, there was an issue of uh, legal, different legal systems. And uh, there was also an issue of uh, a long process and the complexity of mutual legal assistance. And then there was also a suggestion as to whether we need to harmonize our laws, our legal framework in terms of asset recovery. So when I was looking at that program, uh, basically on the topics, I was actually wondering and say, what is the problem? Why are we not progressing? Is it because of the processes? Is it because of the procedures? Is it because of length, mutual legal assistance? Then I came to realize they are no longer a problem, but we are the problem. Because we are not actually uh, walk the talk. We are not actually commit ourselves. Because it does not make sense when a request is sending to your country and you keep mum, you don't give feedback, you don't act timely. So is that the problem of the procedures? No. Is it? Would it be the problem for the procedure if you don't even respond? Even to say, I acknowledge the receipts of your MLA. So I think we are the problems. So we need to clean up the house first. We need to commit and honor the instrument that we have signed as a legion and our, our the world at, at large. So when I was also uh, looking at the issue of money around, I mean, mutual legal assistance, I happened to read a, a report, a research paper report that was actually done by the, the Serious Organized Crime and Anti-Corruption Evidence, which was actually conducted on a transnational governance networks against corruption, cross-border corruption, and among, among law enforcement. It was published this uh, very May. So one of the interviewees, uh, a prosecutor from the Balkan Westerns, he told them that some states, I, I beg to quote, particularly the most powerful ones in Europe or in the world, even don't bother to acknowledge the receipt of our letter. We don't hear back from them. We don't know whether the letter is in a drawer, the bin may be, or somewhere around in the procedure. So basically, we are the one actually creating these challenges. Because as you all know, a request, especially on a mutual legal assistance request, cannot be sent without being uh, uh, prepared uh, through uh, informal communications. We know for sure the information that we are looking in that uh, jurisdiction are there. This is why you see the use of uh, informal networks uh, like ARINEA, ARINSA, and other ARINS uh, network, FIU to FIU communication, the Interpol, they all gather and have those intelligence information at hand before player a request. Now, why would you keep a long time without responding uh, with a request? So basically, we are the ones actually uh, uh, hinder or spoil the whole process. Because imagine you have a case in court, it is just waiting for the information that has been sent to the requesting, uh, uh, requested uh, country. You are not responding time. And as we all know, as prosecutors, the case has a limitation in court. For some times, a witness may lose their appetite to continue, and sometimes may be unavailable. You cannot get them. Because a, a, a request is in your country. How would that request stay for five or, or 10 years? 
So we have to change our mindset and commit ourselves and walk the talk. Because at the end of the day, if we are not committed, even if you can harmonize the law, we will not go anywhere. Also, in the issue of uh, uh, asset recovery against the money laundering, is very critical in the fight against corruption and any other organized crime. You cannot win uh, a, a fight if we don't remove appetite to the criminals. That means we need to follow the money. So as a prosecutor, okay, you have a role to play. To do what? To advise the investigators to ensure that they do, they follow the money. This is why when you look at the uh, SAMLAG uh, mutual evaluation report and the FATF mutual uh, evaluation report, there is a lack of uh, investigators and prosecutors on doing or conducting parallel financial investigation. When you look at the recommendation 30 of the FATF, it, it emphasizes on the issue of doing parallel financial investigation. You cannot uh, remove appetite of these criminals if you don't follow the money. So we have the role to play to ensure that we follow the money, and at the end of the day, we will uh, have a better place to, to hinder those uh, criminals. So now, as a matter of uh, going forward, I would like to advise uh, that we need to have a central authorities platform whereby they can exchange information informally when the request comes, at least to monitor and track those incoming and outgoing uh, uh, requests so that to minimize those bureaucracies. Because at the end of the day, we are the problem and not the procedures. So my, uh, my, my, my call to you is to have such a, a platform, a platform to do that. And of course, uh, the issue of uh, financial, uh, parallel financial investigation is very critical. We must do that. And as the prosecutors, uh, you have to allow to play to advise the investigators to ensure. As a matter of time, I had uh, a lot of, uh, of course, recommendations, but because of time, let me end here and allow other colleagues to come over. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Lillian. Um, uh, we'll move on to Ama and uh, Wanyama, uh, Senior Technical Advisor. And uh, um, five minutes, please, and then uh, uh, Xavier will come in, and uh, Jennifer will wrap it up with uh, uh, another uh, five minutes each, so because we're running short of time. So we can have uh, maybe some time, two or three minutes for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, DPP Malawi. Uh, I thought when you whispered to me, you told me I have all the time in the world, but uh, you've just said I have uh, five minutes. Yeah, so before I start, uh, I know it's uh, uh, after lunch. Just to confirm if your neighbor is not sleeping, just look at your neighbor. You can just turn and look at your neighbor. We've confirmed everyone is awake. Someone is saying no. Yeah, just wake him up. He'll wake up. Um, let me start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Alma Wanyama. I work for the European Union, uh, Anti-Money Laundering and Trafficking in Human Beings project. That is, in short, AMLTHB. Uh, it's an EU-funded project. Uh, this comes, uh, we started in 2019, and um, we have a few more years to go. And uh, we follow our predecessor project that was called AML CFT, that was anti-money laundering and counter-financing of terrorism. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, AML briefly, and uh, I think my colleagues have talked about it. It was spoken about yesterday. And uh, just to say that uh, our region, Africa, um, is vulnerable. We are predisposed to organized crime yeah, because of some of our issues, uh, economic, uh, political issues, um, among others. So we are predisposed to this organized crime. Just to be alive to the fact that uh, when we talk about organized crime, uh, definitely there's an aspect of finance involved. Yeah, even the ideological uh, crimes like terrorism, they need finance to, um, to operate. 
So we are talking about uh, financial investigation and ad uh, adopting AML measures when it comes to curbing organized crime uh, focus. Uh, one of the, uh, the issues uh, we also need, are alive to because we are all experts in our fields is that uh, when we arrest uh, these uh, people who are involved in organized crime, uh, that is a part of the job. Being arrested is, I mean, an oops for them. It's part of what they expect being arrested. But when it comes to their finances, once you hit their finances, then, I mean, it's not worth it, you know? The worth is what makes them uh, do these uh, crimes. Uh, like it has been mentioned again by my colleagues, so I'll not belabor on that uh, part, is financial, uh, having, when you open a file on organized crime, then definitely there has to be a parallel investigation on financial investigation. So when there's an organized crime, there's financial investigation, there's AML, and there's PF also that comes to it. So all these issues uh, put together can uh, bring up, uh, um, come up with a good uh, case, you know. And when you look at, uh, there's a global Africa index, yeah? Uh, when you Google that index, it shows that um, AML frameworks in Africa is low. That, when you look at it, it shows uh, the index, East Africa Central, it shows the index. If I had my PowerPoint, uh, I would have uh, uh, showed, showed it, but it's, you can Google it. It shows that uh, the AML CFT framework in Africa is low. Uh, for East Africa, is higher, uh, just uh, at, the, at, the, at the cut, that is 50%. But for others, it shows that it's a bit low. And uh, uh, that when you look also at uh, the FATIF uh, and the SEMLAG uh, recent reports, they indicate that in Africa, there is compliance, about 70% compliance. The issue comes in on effectiveness. So compliance is fine. But when it comes to effectiveness, it, there, there comes an issue. Because now when it comes to effectiveness, we are talking about implementation. And this is where we, us we usually have a challenge. Uh, and this is everywhere, it's universal anyway, let's not only uh, uh, focus it, it's universal. Implementation is not such an easy thing because it involves a lot of issues like resources, uh, staff, so much. So implementation is what is wanting. And uh, we as a project, uh, we cover about uh, 16 countries, that is from the Greater Horn of Africa and six countries from across the Indian Ocean. And we've come in and tried to assist countries, assist institutions when it comes to effectiveness. And uh, we've partnered greatly with, uh, of course, ODPP Kenya. And I'd like to thank Mr. Nurudin Haji, though my director also passed his uh, gratitude, um, on um, ca coming up with these uh, measures to improve effectiveness of these FATF standards. So one of the things we've done is come up with uh, guidelines on terrorism and terrorism financing, yeah? And uh, this is a first in East and Central Africa of these guidelines under uh, the leadership of uh, ODPP Kenya. And also some of the things we've done, we, we have uh, conducted uh, trainings on financial investigation We've developed curriculums on financial investigations. One of the things that uh, the project does is we do not try to reinvent the wheels. Appreciation is given to institutions, of course, who already have uh, training institutes. So it's not a matter of reinventing the wheel, but to appreciate the fact that financial investigation and AML measures is a new, fairly new um, aspect, and uh, it needs uh, a lot of... Uh, um, training. Officers need a lot of training when it comes to financial investigation. And that is what we've been doing, coming up with the curriculums, training bank managers, bank compliance officers. We've trained uh, about 4,000 bank compliance and bank managers um, in Kenya through the leadership of uh, Mr. Saitoti, who is the FRC director. And uh, of course, him being the host of these trainings and funded by the project, they are able to get uh, quality STRs 
quality STRs. Thank you, uh, DPP Malawi. Yeah, let me just mention something because I won't mention uh, everything. Uh, uh, it was mentioned yesterday about uh, judiciary uh, training and uh, when it comes to these emerging trends. And I was, this was mentioned by a friend of mine who is in the, a, a, a judge who said that, you know, judges do not know everything, especially on these emerging trends. We do not know everything and we thirst for knowledge. We need to know, we need to understand because it's not, it's very embarrassing when somebody comes to us and we do not understand what is happening. So they do um, uh, appreciate when they, they, they are trained on some of these emerging issues and uh, emerging trends, especially when it comes to AML and financial investigation. We've also partnered with uh, my colleague here, Arinea, to also train prosecutors, investigators on issues of asset recovery and the importance of that as uh, one of the AML measures being applied. So um, I don't have much time. In fact, my time is up and uh, I'm going to cede ground to the next speaker. Thank you for listening to me. A hand for Ama. Uh, thank you very much, Ama. Um, partnerships, one of them, and uh, uh, as Lillian put it, uh, we are the ones who are a problem, but then a problem cannot be an excuse for cooperating among us or coordinating. Uh, we move on to Xavier, uh, Assistant uh, United States uh, uh, Attorney General. Um, five minutes, please, and then uh, we we'll wrap it up with Jennifer. Thank you. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Really honored to be here. Uh, I'm, I am an assistant U.S. attorney in the United States, but I am not here in my official uh, capacity. I'm here as a representative with the Attorney General Alliance. Uh, in that spirit, uh, whatever I convey to you is my own thoughts and opinions and does not represent the view of the U.S. attorney or the United States in general. Hopefully I covered my obligation. <laughs> All right, so uh, five minutes is absolutely not enough time. Um, asset recovery is a huge topic. It's a significant topic, um, and there are a lot of different training opportunities that AGA offers, and for the nations that, that, that feel that there's a need, I would say contact Chooks and see if we can establish something to do some capacity building. Um, we can go to the next slide. I'm gonna just jump in and get started. Uh, so, so the real question is, so what is asset recovery? Uh, in essence, it's the process of identifying, tracing, and restraining assets for the purposes of forfeiting the property and converting the interest to the government. Um, said property is going to be the proceeds of any kind of illegal activity. It's going to be proceeds or derivatives of those proceeds or instrumentality of the crimes. Um, and it may apply to a broad range of offenses in the United States. Uh, your money laundering offenses gives you the most uh, flexibility with regard to forfeiture, uh, but then there are other predicate offenses. Um, this is an important principle in the U.S. Uh, framework for asset forfeiture because you have to tie your criminal charge to a specific forfeiture statute. And, and they're not all the same. Uh, so we, we promote charging money laundering when you have the opportunity uh, because, as I mentioned, it allows you to cast a wide net. Uh, there are certain drug crimes that only allow you to have uh, the proceeds and some facilitating property. There are some white-collar crimes that are codified under Title 18 that will only allow you to have just the proceeds, not the involved in property. But when you charge money laundering, you, you cast a wider net and uh, you're able to get the commingled funds. Uh, next slide. So why is it important? Uh, we've kind of echoed this throughout the full conference. Uh, uh, His Excellency came and spoke about financial crimes and, and kind of why asset recovery was important, uh, why what we do is important. Um, in short, uh, to disrupt and dismantle criminal organizations, to disincentivize uh, the illegal activity by disgorging ill-gotten gains, uh, restoring directly impacted victims, uh, but probably more importantly, it promotes trust and faith in the rule of law and institutions. Uh, the people need to know that the work, I'll, I'll slow down, sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to get a lot in the five minutes that I have here. <laughs> Uh, so so th the people that, that we work for uh, in our countries, uh, and, and collectively in general, because the world is flat, as they say, right? So everything that we do is interconnected. Um, and, and the work that we do, it, it, it needs to promote trust. It needs to promote faith in, in the work that we're doing, because we need the buy-in. We need our citizenry to support our efforts so that, there's, so, so that we're all involved in this social contract together and, and hopefully working towards a better world. Uh, next slide. All right, so, so I read a report pretty recently that says that 76% um, of nations are complying with FATF's uh, 40 recommendations, which is an incredible number, and it's up from 36% in 2012. 
Uh, to me, what that signals and, and what events like this signal is that the collective consciousness is, is absolutely focused on, on remediating some of the, the trends and, and normalities that resulted in, in failures in some of our systems historically. That we are now at a point where we're focusing in on the best practices so that we can create better systems and, and, and promote uh, you know, better lives for, for the people that depend on us. Um, looking at FADF as it relates to asset recovery, uh, we can look to two particular recommendations that, that give us some guidance. Uh, recommendation four uh, essentially asks that we adopt uh, uh, measures to allow confiscation without criminal conviction. We're talking about your non-conviction-based forfeitures. Um, we call it civil forfeiture in the U.S. Uh, and then the next slide will tell us about recommendation 38. Uh, recommendation 38, at, in, in essence, it promotes the mutual legal assistance uh, by asking nations, almost requiring nations, to create mechanisms to respond to requests uh, for, from other countries to identify and, and restrain assets. Um, this is an important tool when we're talking about leveraging these relationships that we're cultivating here in order to, to, to stop uh, money laundering offenses and, and stopping the dissipation of assets that might be stored in, in other jurisdictions. Uh, we've heard it a couple times uh, throughout this conference, maybe a lot more than a couple times, but the necessity to develop these uh, relationships uh, amongst each other so that you can cultivate the, the informal channels um, as, a, as a way to kind of get the conversation started uh, as you move into the more formal channels, which are absolutely essential. Um, a shout out to OIA at the U.S. where we do our mutual legal assistance uh, treaty uh, responses. But again, building these relationships allows us to, to, to satisfy these recommendations and also to do the work more efficiently. Uh, next slide. <laughs> Slow down or move on. All right, yeah, I'm not gonna have a lot of time here. This is, all right, so let's go, this, can we skip a little bit? Uh, next slide, right here, we're gonna leave it here. All right, so I think this is probably the most important slide that I have here, although I think that they're all noteworthy. Um, Pre-seizure planning, so whenever you are engaged in, in an investigation, um, and, and we, we refer to it as a takedown, but when you're approaching the part of the investigation where you're no longer covert, meaning you're, you're no longer kind of doing your, your, your investigative tools where your target doesn't know that they're subject of an investigation and you're moving into the overt stage of your investigation, um, you should be thinking about the, the pre-seizure planning. This is the part of the process where you're identifying assets that are gonna be subject to seizure. So what did this individual purchase with their illicit money? Uh, where did they hide it? What bank accounts are they, are they using to facilitate the offenses? Like we need to get a full scope of the financial profile of this individual so that we know, or this, this organization, whatever the target is, we need to figure out what, what they have that, that could be subject to seizure and forfeiture down the line. In that process, we need to start to do some, uh, some litigation risk. So we need to think about what other owners of these properties could there be and what interest might they raise down the line if we try to restrain it and pursue it for forfeiture and then they wanna file an action that suggests that there's some reason why we shouldn't pursue forfeiture. And there are a list of defenses that if we had more time we could talk about. Uh, but these, these are things that we wanna get ahead of. Uh, the location of the asset is going to be important because we need to know where it is. Uh, this is another reason why these mutual legal assistance is really important because if the assets are located in a foreign jurisdiction, we need to ensure that we have partners on the ground in that jurisdiction that can support our, our, the, the restraint of these assets. Um, there's, an, there's, there's something called a net equity report. Um, so when you're doing pre-seizure planning, one of the things you need to take account for is, is the cost associated with it. And this is something that oftentimes goes overlooked, and, and when you have to deal with it, it, it can be a frustrating process to kind of dig yourself up from the mistake. Uh, pre-seizure planning essentially is a, is, a, is a concept that suggests that you need to figure out the value of the asset before you decide to take it. So if you know this individual purchased a car with the illicit money that they have, and they paid $50,000 for the car with illegal money, but they've wrecked the car, they've crashed it several times, it probably only cost about $1,000, 
it may not be worth your effort to seize that car anymore because you're going to spend money to seize it, you're going to spend money to store it, and, and by the time you go to auction to sell it, you may not get the money that you spent trying to, to preserve it. So, so getting a net equity report on all of the assets that you're considering to seize is something that you definitely want to consider in your pre-seizure planning. Uh, when you're talking about currency or accounts, you know, that becomes less important because the value is what it is, but when you're talking about property, uh, personal property or real estate, you definitely want to make sure that you're covering your basis in this regard. Um, you absolutely want to assess the security risk uh, before you're, you, you execute your seizure warrants or your search warrants. You need to know if your targets are heavily armed, you know, if they're, if they're violent or have some kind of violent propensity. These are things you want to get ahead of. Um, you want to know who the seizing agency is. Uh, this is important in the U.S. because even if you're dealing with a multi-agency investigation, uh, only one agency can essentially get the credit for the seizure, uh, at least on the front end. And after the forfeiture process has been completed, then there are conversations about how do you share the, 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 uh, the assets. So how does the agency split the credit? Um, asset management is another area that's oftentimes overlooked, and it goes to the concept of, well, how do you, how do you maintain these things? Um, you know, if, you, if you've gone out and you seized a bunch of cars um, and you see some, you know, some livestock, you know, you have to figure out, well, who's going to take care of these things? You know, if you're talking about livestock, then you have to think about uh, who's going to be the veterinarian that's going to manage the, the, the health and well-being of these animals. Um, if you're talking about cars, you know, who's going to maintain it? Who's going to turn the engine on, you know, every few days so that the batteries don't die and you incur additional expenses? Um, in the U.S., we have a U.S. Marshal Service. Uh, they basically do that work for the U.S. Attorney's Office and for the Department of Justice at large. Um, but but this, this is just another thing that you want to be considering. If we had more time to talk about the litigation uh, considerations for the asset management portion, then we would talk about why sometimes civil forfeiture is more advisable than, than criminal forfeiture or perhaps doing a parallel track because if you just go criminal, it could take years to wrap up a criminal case. And if you have an asset that's just sitting and depreciating over the course of years, uh, it may not be in your best interest. So if you're implementing a civil forfeiture option, then you may have an opportunity to get a final order of forfeiture and get that asset liquidated long before you're able to reach a criminal conviction. Is that good? All right, thank you very much, Zephyr. Another hand of applause for him process of a crime, disruption of uh, uh, criminal organizations, and uh, uh, non-conviction based uh, confiscation, some of the takeaway uh, from his presentation. Jennifer, please, you have the floor, and then um, we'll go into the discussion as to what really we can do to harmonize the network for, for, for or to simplify the money laundering and asset recovery when it comes to cross-border. Thank you. Jennifer. I'll try again. Zikomo, asante. About his amchana? Was it fatigue? Dena yesterling for the Ethiopians here. It's almost time to hit the beach. I'll be very quick. I'll try to anyway. It's an absolute honor to speak to you today. I, um, my name is Jennifer Riddle. I uh, work at the British High Commission in Nairobi and I, uh, I'm on loan to the Foreign Office from the UK's Crown Prosecution Service. So I think that's what matters to you. I'm a prosecutor back home, I'm a prosecutor in my heart. And I'm going to talk to you about a few different things today. And the brief was to talk about harmonization and frameworks between countries. And I want to suggest that harmonization begins at home. I stole that from Nick earlier today. If we can make our domestic legislation and regulations and procedures as simple as possible and as efficient as possible, and I think that's what uh, my colleague here was referring to, it will be much easier to harmonize internationally. When two countries, when, when another country comes and sees that your rules and regulations are quite simple, maybe when they're updating, maybe they'll want to harmonize. 
And I should start by saying that our proceeds of crime legislation is huge. You would break your printer if you tried to print it. So uh, I would just say if you can uh, make things as simple as possible, that would be a huge start. And as you're doing your, uh, as your investigators are doing their investigations, have a parallel or an integrated financial strategy. We've talked about this. An international strategy. Start as early as possible with anything you, you think might be international. And use your networks. This event here is fantastic. We have heard some fantastic practices shared by panelists and from the room. But I think the most important thing that you will come away with is increasing your networks. Having the contact details of people in different countries that you can call upon when you need them. So, so use that opportunity. And then seizing assets is very critical as part of your financial strategy. Make sure you have an asset register if there isn't one in place already. Uh, consider early auctioning if that's allowed under your legislation or consider seeing if legislation can be uh, adjusted to allow early auctioning. But back to, uh, back to kind of the UK and the, the idea of harmonization begins at home. We have very similar threats. If you want to understand the threats facing the UK at the moment, you can look at uh, the National Crime Agency's National Strategic Assessment. They produce it every year. And they have said that on the increase is money laundering, fraud, cybercrime, bribery, corruption, and sanctions evasion. All of the things that you've been talking about. It's likely that over 12 billion pounds of criminal cash is uh, generated annually in the UK and hundreds of millions laundered, both generated from within the UK and from outside of the UK. So within our system, we have various different institutions and I'll run through them very quickly. The Crown Prosecution Service is the main prosecuting authority in England and Wales, and it has specialized proceeds of crime support. And they will work in partnership with lots of other agencies, especially the investigative agencies, and if at all possible, are involved as early as possible in the investigation. We have a, a, a a, another prosecuting authority called the Serious Fraud Office, and it is multi-agency by design. It has investigators and prosecutors embedded together. They work together on the same, uh, the same cases from the very start, and they, will, they have a very small number of the most complex, most difficult cases. They, we, the Crime Prosecution Service and other agencies have the authority to enter into deferred prosecution agreements, but that really is the serious fraud office's game. That is, uh, that's what they, uh, they've, they've done, uh, the deferred prosecution agreements in the UK up till now. Very briefly refer to the UK Central Authority and echo what was said before. Advanced copies can make a huge difference. If you can send draft copies, while things are going through the formal process, or, or even in advance of the formal process starting, then we, we can ensure at the UKCA that, that all of the things that we require under our legislation are met within your request. And as I said, use your networks. Uh, come and find the people in the central authorities that you need to speak to. Double check what it is they require, because it will be much quicker to do it early than to wait until your request is uh, rejected. Okay, very briefly, we have the National Economic Crime Center. This is uh, led by the National Crime Agency, which is our main uh, law enforcement agency that leads on organized crime. But what's unique about the NEC, so I'll call it, we, we love acronyms in the UK. Do you all love acronyms? You all love using, <laughs> using lots of letters. So the National Economic Crime Center is the NEC. And it includes the private sector. And it's, it's really, it, it's only a few years old and they are working on uh, ensuring that banks and financial institutions are involved in discussions both strategically and operationally. And sitting within the neck is another acronym, the GIMLET, the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force. The GIMLET is, uh, is, its model is collaboration and collective ownership. And I think His Excellency referred to those two words earlier today, collaboration and collective, he didn't say ownership, but I'll add that one in. Um, and we include f more than 40 financial institutions within the Gimlet. Intelligence sharing goes on, strategy uh, is involved, there are expert groups that look at terrorist financing risks, and there's an alerts function when there's specific alerts that need to be shared with other, uh, other institutions, other banks, then non-sensitive intelligence material can be uh, shared through that vehicle. There's been 
more than 6,000 internal investigations started by the financial institutions through the Gimlet and 280 arrests and so far a seizure or restraint of over 68 million pounds. I'm afraid I don't have the stats for uh, actual confiscation and conviction, which is what prosecutors care about, but uh, um, it's, it's an interesting model. Lastly, uh, I would like to, or second last, penultimately, I promise, uh, I'll talk about the International Anti-Corruption Anti Coordination Centre. Has anyone heard of the IACCC, the International Anti-Corruption Coordination Centre? It's based in London, and it has representative members from the US, the UK, obviously, Singapore, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia in backwards alphabetical order. It has support from Interpol, it has observers from Switzerland and Germany, and it has associate members of Cayman Islands, Gibraltar, Guernsey, Isle of Man, Jersey, Mauritius, Seychelles, Turks and Caicos. I'm coming. And it is a fantastic tool. If we're talking about harmonization of frameworks, the IACCC has been designed to help you in your grand corruption investigations. You can take your investigation information and give it to these intelligence uh, it, law, law enforcement agencies that sit within the IACCC, they are embedded together in the same room and uh, they will support you and uh, it, your investigations on grand corruption. So I really want to encourage you, if you haven't heard about it, go on to the National Crime Agency's website, look up the IACCC, IACCC, and, um, and I'm, hopefully it will be of use to you. Very lastly, uh, another example of harmonization is the FRAC, the Framework for the Return of Assets from Corruption for Kenya. And it's an agreement between the UK, Jersey, Switzerland and Kenya to return uh, assets that are uh, the subject or, or have been found to be the subject of corruption. And just in March, 3.5 or th around 3 million uh, pounds was returned from Jersey, the island of Jersey, to Kenya. So thank you very much. That was very fast. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, the simplified processes, um, intelligence sharing, as uh, others have already said, networks and partnerships, um, seizure and register are some of the issues that uh, we can take home from Jennifer's presentation. And thank you very much to the whole panel. Another round of applause for them. Sorry that I was giving you pressure. But uh, I've been told that I'm uh, running short of time. And uh, uh, possibly we can have uh, um, interactions, a few questions that can be taken by the panel and uh, uh, comments on the presentations uh, on how we can come up with uh, maybe a harmonized process for asset recovery. And uh, uh, if at all, how that can work and uh, what is it that needs to be done and whether it's actually workable as well. Um, during one of the presentations, there was uh, an example of Tanzania where actually they've taken away some of the bureaucracy, the diplomatic process and some of the uh, uh, exchanging documents. And uh, maybe one of the issues is in our various countries, do our laws really allow us to take away the bureaucracy that is, or maybe some of the countries, something that we can consider as prosecutors. And uh, according to uh, um, Lillian's uh, uh, comment that maybe we are the ones who are a problem, how can we do better? Maybe, uh, what is it that we can do? Any comments from the floor, questions to the panel? Uh, we have heard from the United States, Rwanda, and we heard from the networks uh, um, uh, and the project as well. We've heard from UK, um, comments from the floor from various countries. It's a sharing of experiences and uh, what processes we have in our various countries. Thank you. With uh, uh, Nigeria here and then there's Tanzania there, I think Paul, and then that side as well, and uh, DRC, and I'll uh, finish with, uh, yes, from there. Uh, and uh, there's also uh, the DPP uh, 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 and president for uh, EASCA. Thank you. Uh, Nigeria, you're with Thank the you very Thank much. You. My name is Abubakar Mohammed, Director of Public Prosecution of the Federation of Nigeria. My is a question. Do you think it's necessary to have a separate body for the management of recovered assets, a separate, a separate agency. Uh, so the question is, do I, do I think it's important to have a separate entity? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, 
you know, oftentimes one of the, the, the concerns when you deal with the work that we do is, is, is uh, self-interest and people having a perception of, of self-interest. And I think when you have an outside entity that's in charge of, of managing assets, that it, it creates a, a distance uh, between the seizing agency and the agency that's managing it, that supports it. The other answer to that is it, 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 it's almost a necessity because your agency may not have the specific capacity to, to manage a particular kind of asset. So out of necessity, you have to outsource that. So if you have a, a sophisticated asset, let's just talk about a specific, a building uh, that has tenants in it. Your agency, your office may not want to be a landlord. So you want to have a separate outside entity that's going to be in charge of, of managing that specific resource. Or in the US, we'll go to the court and get uh, a, a receivership appointed to have a, a, a completely independent private sector organization that will facilitate the management of that property. Oh, we had another question from, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Je représente la justice du Royaume du Maroc. Je remercie les intervenants cet après-midi. J'ai bien écouté euh, l'intervention de notre euh, collègue du Rwanda. Et euh, si vous vous rappelez hier, j'ai bien mis en avant l'expérience des magistrats de liaison. C'est grâce à ces magistrats de liaison qu'on peut communiquer facilement. À propos de, de, de ce qu'il a bien expliqué concernant les, euh, comment ça les copies avancées, on a déjà eu l'expérience, le Royaume du Maroc avec euh, le Royaume du Belgique, donc, on n'a pas supprimé le, la voie diplomatique, mais on travaille déjà avec une copie avancée qui se fait euh, communiquer via les magistrats de liaison, j'en reviens toujours, et euh, à la fin, on, on, on peut quand même activer, avoir euh, le, le, le minimum de temps pour traiter les dossiers. Ça, d'un côté, d'un autre côté, je m'aligne aussi à ce qu'a répété mon collègue du Rwanda sur la coopération sécuritaire et judiciaire. Donc, euh, au Royaume du Maroc, déjà en 2015, un centre d'investigation euh, judiciaire a été mis en place en collaboration entre le ministère de l'Intérieur et euh, le parquet, euh, le parquet de, de, de Rabat qui s'occupe du terrorisme et sous euh, le, le, le contrôle et le pôle du ministère public marocain. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. Um, there was Diara said another comment and then we'll have a Merci pour la parole. Je suis Pierre Chindano de la République démocratique du Congo. À propos des coopérations informelles et des documents de draft qui peuvent être avancés, je voudrais vous rassurer que des plateformes de procureurs, ce sont des plateformes solides. Je prends un exemple concret. Avec les États-Unis, nous n'avons pas un accord bilatéral, par exemple, de coopération judiciaire. Mais nous nous sommes servis dans un dossier que j'instruisais, où je ne savais pas comment, par où commencer avec notre entrée du judiciaire. C'est un procureur américain, et je salue les collègues américains qui, qui ont parlé. Il s'appelle Tom, Thomas Barros. Il est de, du département de, la, de justice des États-Unis. Parce que vous savez, aux États-Unis, le ministre de la justice est en même temps le procureur général des États-Unis. Alors, qu'est-ce que nous avons fait ce que nous avons constaté, les Américains avaient été partie prenante à la Convention des Nations Unies contre la criminalité transnationale organisée. Et dans cette convention, ils ont désigné comme autorité centrale Office of International Affairs. Alors, quand nous avons rencontré notre collègue, tout ce que nous avions demandé, c'était dans une conférence des procureurs, c'était en Chine, il m'a demandé seulement d'envoyer un email. Avant qu'on envoie l'email, on avait déjà envoyé l'entraide, la, la demande d'entraide officielle par, par la voie officielle, la voie hiérarchique, diplomatique et consort. Mais nous avons reçu la réponse dans un temps record, alors que ce qui était parti par voie officielle, on ne nous a jamais répondu. La réponse que nous avons immédiatement, c'était des rapports là entre procureurs. La coopération informelle a été plus, plus rentable pour nous dans ces dossiers qui est la coopération formelle. Et voilà pourquoi je vous exhorte, quand vous êtes dans des cadres comme celui-ci, 
de ne jamais hésiter d'échanger des contacts et pas de profiter dans notre carrière. Et nous, nous l'avons fait avec les Américains. Et le, le, le procureur américain m'a connecté en même temps à quatre autres procureurs. J'aime encore les noms. Il vous dit, vous avez besoin de données bancaires, contactez tel. Vous avez besoin de fugitifs, contactez tel. Vous avez besoin pour la cybercriminalité, contactez tel. Alors, c'est un cas, ce n'est pas théorique, mais c'est de la pratique. Et voilà pourquoi, quand nous venons ici dans des rencontres comme ça, nous devons capitaliser. C'est juste une contribution que j'apporte. Il m'a demandé de faire une interprétation de ce que vous venez de dire, notre collègue du Maroc et notre co co collègue du, euh, de la République démocratique du Congo. Si je me trompe, vous allez me corriger. Et what uh, our colleague said from Morocco, she was emphasizing the importance of having uh, these advanced copies. So she, she was sharing her experience because she used to be a liaison or, or uh, magistrate in, in Brussels, in Belgium, working with the, the federal prosecution. And they used the similar uh, mechanism, like what I said, like uh, sending advanced copies, starting working on those advanced, uh, advanced copies, doing some activities without uh, suppressing or eliminating the former ones. So she, she was saying that it, 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 it works perfectly. And uh, the, our colleague from DRC he was saying, he was giving an example on how he, they use those informal communication without also uh, suppressing the former ones. And he, he, he gave a, an experience on how he communicated with uh, a US magistrate prosecutor and the case was very well handled, just exchanging emails. So he was emphasizing that uh, this informal communication, this informal mechanism worked perfectly. Thank you. Uh, just, Thank just to be clear on the, on the informal channel, so you pursue the MLAT because you need the official documents to submit as evidence in your criminal case. So the informal channels are, are effective to an extent. Uh, they don't replace getting a, the, the formal process if you're going to fully cultivate your, your investigation and, and build a prosecution. We, we had uh, uh, Paul from uh, Tanzania and uh, Egypt, and then uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, AAC president, and then IAP president. Thank you. Just two comments uh, on the bureaucracy. So as uh, uh, discussed by a couple of uh, presenters here, it takes a long time for uh, these requests to be transmitted from one authority uh, to the other. So say if Tanzania was to send a request to the, uh, let's say to the, to, 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 to the DPP Uganda, then the request would have to go to our MFA, Foreign Affairs, and then the Foreign Affairs would send it to the Ugandan High Commission in Dar es Salaam, and then they'll channel it to the uh, uh, MFA in Uganda, and then MFA Uganda will channel it to the DPP. So in 2018, we had an uh, amendment in our, uh, in our law. First, uh, the DPP was designated as a central authority for mutual legal assistance in Tanzania. And the law mandated the DPP to receive and, re and send requests directly to foreign authorities across the globe. So that was a very bold uh, uh, amendment which was done and uh, it has helped us a great deal uh, because some of these requests uh, require uh, uh, an urgent action. For instance, if you want to have a, a restraint of a bank account and you do not expect you may be able to have it restrained if the request follows the, you know, the, you know, the diplomatic channel. And I'm aware of a few other countries which have also done away with uh, transmission of requests through diplomatic channels. But secondly, just to draw attention to, to the floor, uh, the issue of contact persons. So there is a very useful database which is being uh, managed by UNODC 
it is called Sharing Electronic Resources and Laws on Crime, Sherlock. So in that Sherlock, there is an online directory of competent national authorities, contact, contact persons in all international conventions. Though this uh, directory is, is restricted, it can only be, it, it can only be accessed by authorized uh, personnel. I'm aware of many of my colleagues who are not aware of this useful directory. So anytime, if for instance you want to know the contact person or the correct uh, central authority in, uh, let's say, Guyana uh, or uh, Switzerland, you can simply go to the directory. Uh, it, it is restricted, but you can easily access uh, the, the central authority and the respective uh, contact persons, uh, depending on the type of request you want to send. Thank you. Very much, Tanzania. Um, we have uh, Egypt on the floor and uh, um, uh, DPP Tanzania and uh, IAP President. As we're talking about networks, um, outside uh, there is a desk for IAP, $20 discounted uh, rate uh, for, for, for uh, individual membership where we will learn a lot about all these networks and uh, uh, the website really has a lot of information and uh, uh, information sharing as well. Thank you very much. Um, Egypt, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Mohammed. I'm a prosecutor from Egypt. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the panelists for the, for the speakers. Uh, it's been really informative. Um, I have two questions. Uh, I'll try to be quick. The first one for the Honorable PG of Rwanda. Um, you mentioned um, that you have the crime of the illicit enrichment. Um, and you try to use it uh, in the MLA process and try of the asset recovery MLAs. Um, I was wondering, uh, were the MLA's requests successful and uh, did you find any way to overcome the problem of dual criminality because a lot of jurisdictions doesn't have this crime and they sometimes refuse to enforce the MLA request based on the dual criminality clause? Uh, this is the first question. Um, uh, the second one is for um, all the panel um, regarding seizing of the funds. Um, Excuse me, I, I, I didn't get very well the question. My okay. question addressed. Uh, understood. Okay. Yes. Should I explain? Yeah, okay. Should I explain or go to the next question? The, the first question. The first okay. Question. The first question is: You mentioned the crime of the illicit illicit enrichment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, yes. in our system, we have this crime, but not a, lo a lot of the jurisdiction actually uh, have this kind of crime. And when you send an MLA request, whether tracing the assets or the forfeiture, some jurisdiction refuses to enforce the request based on dual criminality clause. So my question is, did you find any way to overcome this problem, uh, or it's still a hurdle in the enforcement of these requests? Okay. Uh, the second question regarding seizing of assets. Um, so, usually, uh, most of jurisdiction requires some kind of uh, information and, um, and proof of relationship between the crime and the assets that's located abroad. But the problem presents itself when there's a lot, when there are a lot of um, schemes adopted to um, hide these assets. Um, in some cases that we faced, and we had actual cooperation with the UK and the United States on these type of cases, uh, is that the asset goes through a lot of jurisdictions and a lot of trust funds. And I can see the assets at, at the end country, but for me to seize it, I have to prove some kind of relation between the crime and the asset. But to do this tracing, I need to go to other jurisdictions to finally follow the money until it goes to the final okay. country. But that takes a lot of time. And it, the danger presents itself that the perpetrator can actually dis transfer the money to another country. So can I seize the money and what are the legal routes that I can take uh, to seize the money until I can find the enough information from other jurisdiction to finally have a forfeiture? Thank you. Thank you, Egypt. Uh, maybe a quick response from the panel and uh, um, um, DPP Tanzania would uh, take the floor and uh, later IAP president. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to react on this offense of illicit enrichment. As you mentioned, we, 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 sometimes we face the same challenges. For instance, even in uh, our national laws, if, if we get, for instance, an MLA from another country, if they are talking about an offense that is not uh, in our laws, so it's not possible. And the same applies. Some of the jurisdictions do not have this crime of illicit en enrichment. So what do we do? We say, okay, uh, if you do not have it, but uh, do something and act. Because illicit enrichment, it's, uh, it's somehow general. But uh, it, there are other crimes that are, are hidden that led to that person getting uh, the funds or other assets. So what we request is, okay, that's okay, you do have the information. Ask that person where he, he got that money from. And if that person uh, failed to justify the source of the income of the asset, and you, you find out that in those jurisdictions there are some similar offenses, and that will be maybe a start for investigation. So that, that, that's how we, we, we do. Otherwise, we do have similar challenge, but when there is a will, it can be a start of other investigation, investigating other uh, possible crimes. Because you can't let a person who cannot justify the source of the revenue just go like that we, without investigating where he got that, those funds or those assets from. Thank you. Um. Yeah, thank you. And in regards to question number two uh, about the seizure, as to whether to what extent we'll be able to seize, you know, first of all, um, I think it's depend on the legal framework you have, the powers you have as an investigator. Does the law allows you to seize such a property? That's number one. Secondly, there is a threshold to prove that. It's not beyond reasonable doubt that you need to connect or link a tainted property against the offense that has been committed. What it requires is that is there a link between the offense that has been committed against the property that has been tainted. And that one can be uncovered by an intelligence source-led inf investigation. And of course, there is also a use of undercover operations, use the devices to uncover all those uh, 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 issues that connect to the assets that, that are tainted. So in that that's also gives you a, an avenue for you now to seek. It depends. There are some jurisdictions, they can administratively seize seize such an asset, but some jurisdictions, they require you have to take a matter before court of law to seek for such an application so that the court can grant you a, a seizure or order uh, to seize such an, uh, an asset. So it's depend, on the, it's depend on the legal framework you have. But to guide you, just lead uh, the FATF recommendations uh, related to uh, issue of uh, identification. I don't recall the recommendation specifically. Uh, yeah, recommendation 30, and apart from that, there is also recommendation 38 relates to confiscation of assets, where now, um, as a law enforcement agents, you have to have a, a ability to identify, trace, and uh, uh, recover. And of course, um, if you want to recover an asset, first of all, there's those uh, provisional measures which you have, uh, of course, identified. One is seizure. There are some jurisdictions, they, they have uh, fleezing orders, some they have restraint orders. So it depends on the legal framework you have. But how to uncover depends on the capacity, the resources of your, 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 your country, uh, how, how you have been able to capacitate investigators to uncover those uh, kind of assets. I hope I've answered. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Rian. DPP uh, Tanzania, um, you have the floor. And then uh, we'll combine it with the uh, IAP president, and then we'll have a recap. 
I will hand it over to our host, uh, um, uh, DPP uh, Kenya. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I also wa want to take the opportunity to commend the panelists for their good presentations. But I wanted to share the experience of Tanzania on the MRO request. We have been talking of the bureaucracy and the complicated laws. Yes, we need to harmonize and simplify our laws, but this might take long. In Tanzania, having noted that we decided to prepare a simple uh, guideline indicating the procedures to be followed, the laws in a very simple language to, to, to other jurisdictions who are sending our request in, in our country. Because we noted that most of, most of the requests we are not in compliance with our laws. So sometimes we have to reject it or to, 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 to return back. So we will prepare the guideline in a very simple language describing the procedures to be followed. And we distributed this guideline to all of the embassies in, in, in Tanzania and we put it a soft copy in our website. So maybe my fellow uh, uh, head of prosecution services, in, you may adopt this, prepare a, a, a guideline to assist those who are making requests in your country to know the procedure. This will help at least to, 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 to avoid unnecessary rejection or return of the, of the, of the request. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, IAP um, President, and uh, then I'll wrap it up for, for, for the host. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, IP Secretary General, it is in, in fact, uh, but, but that... The My apologies No, no, for no, 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 absolutely not. I, I da don't dare to say that I uh, am the IP President, uh, of course. Um, I, I would like to, to stress the importance of informal organization when it comes to international cooperation. Of course, you have the formal uh, international bodies like Eurojust, uh, for instance, who have an easy access to each other when it comes to international and official cooperation. And my words are not uh, to replace a formal uh, MLA procedure, of course not, but informal uh, contact with your fellow prosecutors all over the world might also help in uh, getting the first contact in knowing who you have to reach to in a certain country and if there is already a uh, official MLA uh, pending perhaps to speed it up and the International Association of Prosecutors is such an informal uh, organization uh, at this stage, you can reach out to the IEP Secretariat and ask us to connect to you to one of our fellow members all over the world, be it in central authority, be it an expert in some of the, I think, eight, nine, ten expertise the IEP knows. But there's more, there's more coming up. Um, during the annual uh, conference uh, this September in Tbilisi, Georgia, the IEP will uh, launch its Prosecutors International Cooperation Platform. And that's a digital platform to reach out to central authorities and expert members all over the world, to chat with them, to mail with them. Against, again, not to replace official MLA procedures, but just to make the first contact or to speed up a formal contact that was already late before. Just one of the benefits of being a member of the International Association of Prosecutors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Secretary General IAP. Um, harmonization of the legal framework on asset recovery is an issue that we really seriously need to consider. Long term, the DPP Tanzania has actually emphasized on it that it might take long, but in the short term, what do we do? Bureaucracies and uh, uh, in our legal frameworks, how do we go about it? Um, these are things that we need to think about. Thank you very much for the panel for the enriching uh, contribution and presentations. And uh, uh, another round of applause, and then I'll hand over the TPP. Thank you. Um, 
think it's already evening, good evening. I'll try to be as short as possible so that we can conclude because we've come to the end uh, of, the, of the session. Um, we will have um, a DPPs, AGs and Prosecutor Generals networking meeting uh, and at uh, 6 p.m. We will meet at the White Sands reception at 6 p.m. So all the DPPs, AGs, and, uh, and uh, Prosecutor Generals. Uh, I'll just read their names very quickly. We'll have Burundi, uh, Francoi. We'll have Democratic Republic of Congo, Mkomo. We'll have Mozambique, uh, Dr. Olinda, Zanzibar, Mrs. Salma. Uh, we'll have the IAP executive, Hendrik and uh, Jan. Uh, we'll have uh, the D uh, Attorney General Seychelles, Mr. Frank. We'll have Z Zambia, Thelma. We'll have Mr. Mwakitalu, Tanzania. Uh, Chol Deng, South Sudan. Um, Ian Malumani, uh, Namibia. We'll have Amabel, Rwanda. Um, Asimwe, John Baptiste, Uganda. Uh, Mr. Boliel, Mauritius. Uh, Yusuf, Ethiopia, George Saad, uh, Egypt, uh, Martins Domingos, Guinea-Bissau, uh, Dem Godfrey, Ghana, Takura Obubisa, we'll also have Rose Takuva, Zambia, we'll have Khalifa Ahmed Khalifa, Sudan, uh, we'll have Weson Gap, Botswana, Mohammed Somalia, uh, Simbongile, South Africa, uh, Dr. Stephen, Malawi, Mrs. Jamila, Morocco, Abu Bakr, Nigeria. Uh, if we could all assemble at the reception, White Sands reception at 6 p.m. Um, we will also have at 9 p.m. a COVID test for those who have... Uh, Well, well, we'll also communicate to you. Um, there will be a, a COVID test, sorry, at 7.30 a.m. on Thursday morning for those who have not done. But we'll also try to arrange uh, more, more, a more convenient time. Uh, for those who have chosen um, the different activities tomorrow, uh, there's a Mombasa tour will start at 9 a.m. If you can uh, assemble at the reception at 9 a.m. The Wasini the island was Sini tour. Uh, you'll have to assemble at 6 a.m. Uh, so there will uh, 6 a.m. in the morning. Yes, it's a it's a bit of a distance. There will be breakfast that will be served at 5:30. No, no. Mombasa will be at 9 a.m. 9 in the morning. Wasini Island. I think majority of people have chosen Wasini. Uh, it will be at six, You will leave at 6 a.m. Uh, they will, yes, uh, uh, yes, uh, and the breakfast will be served at 5.30.